So for one more last time, what do you remember from the last lecture? different forms of team structures, right? The matrix structure organizations and alternatives, different roles, group things, social doping. All right, I take it. Um, so what I wanted to do today is have three parts. Um, I posted, or this will be posted in two minutes, uh, a feedback form uh, on Canvas. So I would like to get some feedback of how to improve this class in the future. In the first part of the lecture, though, I kind of want to go through the entire semester. I picked a bunch of slides. I couldn't get it below 400. Um, so I'm kind of going through them fairly quickly, kind of put the pieces together, kind of repeat a little bit what we talked about. Um, so essentially what I'm asking you in the beginning of each lecture, kind of what you remember from the last time I'm going to, over a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, really learning for final, but I think it's the useful thing just kind of to, to kind of look back and, and see what we talked about and how some of those things might fit together. Um, and I have a bit of a discussion um, after that about where maybe the field might be going, kind of software engineering for AI, what kind of open challenges are, um, how to view this, and I would like to hear your opinions there as well. So I'm gonna start with this. Um, Overview, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free, free to interrupt me. I try to see whether I can actually do this in 40 minutes. All right, so I essentially just picked a bunch of slides. I, I tend to pick the ones that have graphics in them, so it's not super representative, but we started the semester with some introduction, and I kind of introduced the logistics and the pandemic, and we kind of get to know each other. Um, and then I started pretty immediately with kind of a contrast between data scientists and software engineers. And we talked about the different roles and how we care about all kinds of qualities. And actually already in the first lecture, I used this uh, case study and we talked about how it, to actually build such a system, you need to do more than just build a machine learning model. Right? We talked about the syllabus and the structure. I introduced the textbook, which actually at this point you read most chapters of. Um, a few days ago, I kind of went back and thought about should I assign the remaining ones, but this were only kind of a few sparse ones uh, that I think uh, you have the gist anyway. Um, talked about the structure of the course, and then we did introductions, kind of went around the room, um, and I think I covered most of the topics that you mentioned that you were interested in uh, at that point. And the last thing we did in this first lecture is talk about the role of specifications, or more precisely the lack thereof, where traditionally we may have some, uh, but it might be really hard to kind of specify what actually a machine learning model is, and this may actually have to do more with deductive reasoning. Um, and the result in design shapes thinking. Right, so the first case study, is, uh, the first homework assignment essentially built directly on top of this, um, kind of a case study looking into a real project, um, thinking about what are engineering issues and kind of de detecting malicious advertisement. Um, and then in the class, we, I actually spent two lectures talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we talked about what is machine learning, try, kind of tried to define it, had an example of housing price predictions, talked about things like linear regression and decision trees. I actually showed you how decision trees work in more detail. Uh, we talked about overfitting and underfitting and how you detect this and the split of hyper, uh, this using hyperparameters and model parameters and where all these weird words come from. Talked about splitting training and validation set, right? So kind of the basics of, of uh, data science and, and fitting models. Um, talked more about overfitting. Talked about how actually you might want to split this into three parts even and be careful with benchmarks. And that in practice, you actually care about the entire pipeline. Uh, that, it's in, that data scientists work in a very iterative way. Um, kind of a very explorative way, use notebooks. We talked a little bit about advantages and disadvantages of notebooks. And we talked about AI a bit more broadly, that there's a bigger umbrella beyond just the machine learning. We re didn't really go into that much in the class later, right? So it kind of popped up here and there, um, but there's actually a pretty broad uh, range of artificial intelligence, uh, not just 
uh, supervised machine learning um, that kind of act humanely, thinking humanely, thinking rationally, acting rationally, and a bunch of different techniques in this area. So we talked a bit about different problem classes for machine learning, um, looked into neural networks and how they work, how the kind of the step functions work so that you have an idea of why they're hard, why they're hard to interpret, right? We looked at multi-layer and deep learning uh, and some ideas and talked about how some of the problems are really having this huge number of parameters, networks of billions of nodes and weights um, that are pretty big to store. And very briefly, we also talked about kind of old fashioned artificial intelligence that's not machine learning, like Boolean satisfiability uh, that you can use to encode all kinds of problems like uh, configuration issues, constraint satisfaction problems, uh, probabilistic programming, um, and how those kind of approaches might actually give you guarantees. Right, so when they give you an answer, you may have a guaranteed correct answer, at least in a probabilistic sense. Um, as a homework assignment on top of this um, was the first kind of, was a longer assignment, but kind of a warm up assignment to start some modeling, right? I gave you a dump of a Kafka stream, or not a dump, you actually had to get the dump, um, but um, try to predict movie popularity um, to kind of get familiar with the infrastructure. We then talked about model quality, right? So kind of talking about how a model is learned, we try to think about how models, how you can do quality assurance, how even to think about this. And we talked first about, this is a fairly common split that we had later, right? Kind of the machine learning view and then the software engineering view. Um, first, we talked about that machine learning components are kind of these untestable programs. Uh, we don't know the correct answer, right? We don't have a specification. We talked about this, um, we have many, many case studies. This one was cancer detection um, and that the system is much more than the model. Uh, but really at the machine learning level, you talk about things like accuracy. We start with the confusion metrics and that even you kind of always want the baseline, right? Thinking about just 99% accuracy without context might not tell you much. Depends a lot on the problem. Um, we talked about different kinds of mistakes, true positives, sports no negatives, and how they're important, how you can derive this uh, kind of a binary classifier from the mighty problem class, more about true positives, sports negatives, and how sometimes one is worse than the other, right? So that if you just blindly look at accuracy, that might not actually reflect it. But we also later talked about that just false positives and false negatives might also be too simplistic, right? That you actually might need to look at different classes. We talked at, about the issue of kind of different thresholds and how you can have trade-offs there, um, about a bunch of other quality criteria like uh, the mean absolute percentage errors, ranking errors, um, things like this, and natural language processing has different things. And then from a software engineering perspective, we looked at how does this relate to software testing, right? So it kind of feels like software testing, but we don't really care about a single wrong prediction, more about more systematic uh, problems. Right? We talked at length about the Oracle problem and how this is kind of hard. We don't know what the expected outcome is. We have sometimes have labeled data. Um, and for different predictions, we have different accuracy expectations. So we talked that maybe traditional software testing is, there is not a direct one-to-one -one mapping, but maybe there's a better analogy in performance testing. Uh, I talked a little bit about my pet theory of machine learning as requirements engineering, that what we're actually trying to do is come up with a specification. Um, it's much more kind of figuring out whether we are learning the right model, which is validation, rather than checking whether the specification is correctly implemented. Right? So machine learning is much more, well, corresponds much more to kind of requirements analysis in a, in a traditional sense where you have some data, you learn some rules, and then you check whether you have the right rules with your stakeholders, which fits quite well with a bunch of kind of safety and robustness and fairness things that we did, that we talked about later. Um, right, so we talked more about kind of um, how, can we, how can we do quality assurance if we have this weird notion of correctness. Um, and we talked about that maybe a better way to think about this is curating validation data, making sure that you have good validation data um, where it actually is representative of usage data. Uh, you might need to be careful with kind of temporal dependencies, right? Where you, um, you learn on 
on data throughout the entire timeline, it's much easier to predict the points in the middle than points at the end. So there are lots of ways of cheating where you need to be careful, but also that not all inputs are equal, right? So if you just across the board look at accuracy or recall and precision, you might not identify that you're actually breaking very important use cases or that you're um, disadvantaging certain minorities. Um, and because of this, it actually makes sense to identify important inputs. Probably not a single input, but multiple inputs, so that you may have uh, end up with multiple test sets, right? Some of those might be more to regression testing, some might be more important for fairness testing, setting goals, um, and so on. And maybe some of the black box testing techniques provide some inspiration. And we talked a little bit about invariance, um, how that's another way to think about this metamorphic testing is a scientific term in this area where you kind of try to come up with invariance that should hold. Fairness invariance that we talked about later are one example that you can test, some of them you can test in a software system. Um, and simulation-based testing was another kind of idea that we talked about here. Um, and you should automate your test, use continuous integration. There are a bunch of systems for this. So after talking about kind of model quality at a more narrow level, we try to zoom out to the entire system level, right? We talked about that building a system like Temi, like the transcription service requires more than just a machine learning model. You want to think about the entire product that you're building. You involve um, a bunch of different concerns. We had PowerPoint as another example of fall detection, fraud detection, a bunch of different things where we talked about kind of system thinking and most importantly, kind of thinking about user interface design and um, uh, things like how forceful is an interaction? Does it automate things? Does it involve the user, um, right? How frequently is it? How, what's the cost for the user? What's the cost of a false positive? Uh, where you design things in very different ways depending on, uh, um, on, on your problem, right? So that this is really a very domain specific problem where you need to figure out how do you use the prediction of a model in a larger system? We talked about the smart toaster that should not burn down my kitchen and safeguards at the system level and that there's all this kind of infrastructure around the model. And it's really about thinking about pipelines. After this, we talked specifically about goals and success measures. Um, we also had an assignment about this, uh, thinking about um, Spotify was a case study, but thinking about how abstractly can we think of machine learning as prediction machines? What's the business case? Um, for example, better predictions, make it easier for some people to provide a service um, where predictions were much harder in the past. Uh, taxi driving was one of them where now SetNav systems provide much cheaper predictions and just learning routes uh, for years. Then also predictions are much easier or more reliable in some settings than others. And because of this, you can think about the cost and value of data, how it enables cheaper predictions. Um, there was the AI canvas kind of thinking about um, what is the data that we can use? What's the business case? Thinking about this at the, at the larger system um, and cost of predictions. We talked a little bit about risks um, and then maybe the more important part of this lecture was to think about how can we measure success, right? So we talked about different kinds of measures, organizational objectives as the ultimate goal probably, and then um, depending on that, leading indicators, user outcomes and model pr uh, properties, and how you can measure all of this. There was also recitation on measurement. Um, um, we talked about in class about um, automatic uh, ranking of admissions to the master program, what might be the goals, right? What's, what are the overall goals? How you can we break this down to goals for the system? Um, we talked more broadly a little bit about um, everything is measurable, kind of pitfalls in measurement, different scales, um, and how measurement in general is hard. After talking about measurements, we looked again a little bit closer at the model and kind of discussed that there are a bunch of qualities that you might care about in picking a modeling technique, right? Which machine learning technique you pick. So the example was uh, lane assist in this case. Um, you care about all kinds of qualities and there are, <clears throat> there are a bunch of properties that you want. Some properties are more important. They constrain the solution. Um, 
And there are a bunch of qualities like the model size, explainability, things like this that might actually constrain what kind of models you can pick, what kind of solutions you can design. Right? Um, the point is really, I think we hammered this home a bunch of times, accuracy is not everything. Right? Um, data scientists might sometimes focus on accuracy um, very narrowly, but there are all kinds of qualities uh, that we care about. Um, like all of these. We talked about a bunch of them here fairly early. We dove deeper into some of them later, like interpretability, robustness, fairness, um, and then went through a couple of techniques uh, to think about whether linear regression or decision trees or neural networks are more suitable for some tasks than other tasks. What are their common properties? Um, things like this. And that in the end, you have a trade-off analysis of a bunch of different qualities. Um, and that people actually make trade-off decisions in practice, as in the example of the Netflix price, where they had more accurate solutions, but they had added so much complexity that they didn't, that they decided not to adopt this. Um, I gave you a homework assignment here to look at some of the trade-offs, measure some of the qualities, compare three different learning techniques, um, and write a short memo about this, which ones you actually would recommend. After kind of thinking about the larger system and how can we measure some things, uh, we looked more carefully at different mistakes that machine learning systems can make. Right, so this was the first time we talked about risk. It had a bit of a safety component without going too deep into this. Uh, but we talked about a bunch of safety problems already. A bunch of problems here was an Amazon device that hold, held a party on its own uh, where the owner was out of town. Um, a bunch of problems of, we talked about possible sources of wrong predictions, things like correlations that the model picks up on that are not actually causing uh, issues, confounding variables that would explain this, hidden confounds where um, a cancer detection model might actually pick up on certain text in the image that would just indicate the machine and kind of cheat indirectly, right? This is fairly common or a chess playing mechanism that learns um, that Sacrificing the queen is a great move because professional chess players make this before they win, but it's not causal, right? Um, and all kinds of other issues. We talked a little bit about kind of um, how there are things that we know and we don't know um, and how predictions are good for some tasks better than others and very risky for some. Um, and that the models that machine learning models, uh, the mistakes that machine learning models make kind of all over the place, right? So they're not correlated necessarily. We can't really predict them in any meaningful way. They're not like mistakes that humans make. They're hard to fix. When we fix something, we cause another. So as an end result, you essentially should think of a, a machine learning prediction model as a unreliable component, right? It works most of the time, but it will make random mistakes, more or less random. It, it's prone to attacks. Um, so that's something that you should consider in the system design. So you should accept mistakes and think about how to design for them. We talked about a bunch of different strategies to handle mistakes like guardrails, redundancy, voting, humans in the loop, undoable actions kind of in the user interface design, um, maybe interpretable models that you can review. Um, and that to really figure out what you're doing at the system level, you want to understand the risk, you want to understand the consequences of bad predictions. So this is where we talked about a bunch of these risk analysis or hazard analysis techniques like fault tree analysis, uh, FMEA, um, these kind of old techniques that you can use to inspect for common, common problems that I think are very useful because they're designed to detect consequences of kind of unreliable components, prediction, uh, wrong predictions. Um, so you can kind of analyze, understand better what a system might do and whether you have the right safeguards. And we talked about that the word whether it's a machine is kind of a good framework to think about this, also think about feedback loops uh, to specifically look into the interactions, right? The inputs to sensors, can we rely on the input data? Um, the outputs, can we actually achieve the consequences and what kind of, um, uh, what kind of side effects might we have? Um, all right. Um, after looking at risks from a software engineering 
perspective, we looked at software architecture, so the design phase, kind of getting from requirements. So we have some idea of what we want to achieve to some implementation. You typically have some sort of larger design uh, in the middle, right? We talked about Twitter, how as a case study of how they completely redesigned their systems because it was too slow, it wasn't handling the load, and they made some very deep assumptions in upfront that weren't compatible with their growth. And that architecture is really this fundamental kind of baked in notion that you want to get right. Um, and architecture modeling is kind of a domain specific view on specific qualities. Like we looked at these different maps of Pit. Pittsburgh, how they represent different aspects and are useful for reasoning about different properties here. Um, so in this lecture, we talked about augmented reality translation. So Google Glasses that would translate things in real time. We had a kind of different, but somewhat similar uh, case study as part of a homework assignment on uh, a dash cam, right, where we ask about questions, where should the model live? On the phone, on the glasses, in the cloud, we discussed a little bit about what are the different constraints that these design decisions impose? Like how big can the model be? How frequently do we want to update? How much data can we transfer? Things like, like this. Right? There are a bunch of different designs and they have advantages, disadvantages in different contexts. We also talked about trade-offs in terms of telemetry um, and um, uh, decisions about when to update, how often to update, how to update. Um, and we talked a little bit about that the space of patterns is rather underdeveloped, I think, in my view. Um, there's not, like with distributed systems and so on, we have way more patterns how to think about system design. Um, there doesn't seem to be a great deal of different things beyond kind of a microservice architecture or gateway routing architecture um, that, that people think about um, and share and discuss in this space. Um, there's a bunch of cloud services it can reuse. Um, so the homework, as I mentioned, was looking at the dash cam, um, which would get a feature to detect mi missing children, uh, where we ask you to think about risks, think about requirements, and think about the deployment architecture. So we came back after kind of designing everything, we came back to quality assessment, and this time essentially testing in production, right? Where well, this doesn't work, but where production data is kind of the ultimate unseen data um, where you want to get uh, some feedback in production. There's a lot of large design space, kind of telemetry is something that showed up over and over again in this class. Um, but here's a place where we kind of dug in a little bit deeper, thinking about different ways to design telemetry that's more invasive or less invasive. Sometimes you get telemetry data, kind of the labels for free. Sometimes you need to ask humans. Sometimes you can have a smart user interface design that might actually encourage people to give you uh, good telemetry data, good labels uh, that you can improve training. Um, I think those was because modeling, uh, monitoring is important and that kind of collecting telemetry may have its own challenges, right? Um, for example, you, you have privacy concerns, you have concerns about the amount of data that you're collecting, how do you identify telemetry for rare events, can you identify false positives and false negatives, both or just one of them. Um, we looked at an exercise of, uh, which was actually a former midterm question, um, kind of a smart, workout solution and how you can detect uh, people getting injured by this, right? How would you design telemetry for this? Um, and then beyond basic telemetry, we also talked about experiments and production, like A-B testing, implementing A-B testing with feature flags, having some infrastructure for doing this, having using statistics for, for determining this. Um, and then alternative, like shadow releases and canary releases specifically as ideas of kind of A-B testing specifically for releases, right? testing in production and chaos experiments as maybe pushing this quite further uh, specifically for reliability. Um, and this came later, but um, part of the team project you kind of deployed something, um, you deployed the team and later also did some A-B testing or some canary releases in your case um, there. After model quality, 
both offline in the beginning, now online in production. We talked about data quality and data programming, a case study of inventory man management, and we talked about all different kinds of data quality um, measures. So this is often OER context, uh, content well known from databases. There are lots of books on this. Um, how we can talk about uh, different forms of quality. We talked about uh, accuracy and precision here, but um, more important kind of structured, different kinds of quality problems, schema level problem, instance level problem, single source, multiple source. We had a bunch of examples where individual entries were ill-formed or where multiple entries together were inconsistent. Um, like a schema will help you to have data in a consistent form. Right, um, there are a bunch of different schema formats, and then a bunch of techniques that look for kind of redundancies or consistencies across um, different data points. I talked about HoloClean here, which I don't remember. Somebody of you tried um, for one of the homework assignment and wasn't particularly, or Jake, and wasn't particularly happy with. I think at least with the documentation, um, but it kind of has a bunch of ways of kind of probabilistic, um, kind of thinking about invariants and enforcing them and using them for repair. Uh, rule mining is another less probabilistic one. Um, data linter was another idea that we briefly talked about. Um, and then as a specific or important form of data quality, we talked about uh, drift and model decay. We distinguished different forms of drift, constant drift, data drift, and kind of upstream data changes. Uh, but in the end, the effect is always the same, that something changes over time, so your model doesn't fit anymore very well, like the training data and the, the data that you're using in production doesn't work very well. So what you're typically doing is you're retraining the model with updated training data occasionally, which you also did just now um, in your last um, milestone. Right? So, talked a little bit about how you could detect drift by looking at distributions, some tools for this. And then the last part in this lecture was talking about Snorkel as a tool for uh, semi-supervised uh, um, semi learning where you provide small functions to provide partial labels and the system kind of figures out, learns a more labeling function um, so that rather than just manually labeling things. You have multiple labeling mechanisms with different reliability, and you learn a, you learn a labeling functions from these partial things, um, which can be used for all kinds of things. It can be used for automatic labeling of training data, but also for data augmentation and for monitoring and detecting uh, certain kinds of issues. I had a guest lecture here um, talking about the difficulties in production if you're not just thinking about Google's um, and other big companies, but kind of normal companies, right? So they have a lot of data in lots of different sources. It's hard to kind of integrate them. It's hard to build models. Uh, concepts are all over the place. It's expensive. And sometimes it might not actually be worth all the effort um, for the value of the prediction. This fit well into the discussion of um, managing large data sets. So we talked, a case study here was kind of processing or labeling a lot of images or predicting uh, what's in an image for really a large number of images so that you actually need to parallelize things. Um, you have large amounts of input data, training data, and telemetry data and want to deal with this in some form. And so we talked about different forms of databases, including uh, relational databases, document databases, large amounts of log files, and different traditional strategies how to scale in databases like partitioning, replication in different forms, and so on. And then the larger part here was probably thinking about different modes of computing large amounts of data, specifically the contrast between batch processing, taking a huge amount of data, doing long running computations, maybe once a night, uh, versus uh, stream processing. So this is a MapReduce style, right? Versus stream processing where you do things in near real time, kind of have queues of things that are just grabbing things and processing things over time. Event sourcing was one of the larger concepts here, kind of immutable data, right? Append only data, uh, which fits well with a bunch of the new kind of newer uh, processing paradigms and helps with certain decisions and scaling and helps with versioning that we talked about later. 
The Lambda architecture and the data lake were two of the buzzwords that we talked about. It's probably useful to, to know, kind of to think about how to do updates in near real time, but also do larger updates uh, regularly with some batch processings. Yeah. Um, and some of the techniques around this and distributed learning, but um, and some performance measurements. Yes. Infrastructure quality was another thing which was much more kind of traditional testing, right? So most of the infrastructure is more traditional code um, where kind of data quality and uh, model quality might be quite different. We have a lot of infrastructure, all these pipelines and need to test them. So the danger here is mostly silent mistakes, right? We learn a model, we push it, some, something doesn't work in the pushing. So we think we update the model every night, but uh, we're, we're using in production very old models, these kind of mistakes. Um, right, so we want all kinds of test automation. We talked about mocking objects, how you can test for robustness, how you can test correct error handling, right? Even if it depends on data, kind of classic approaches of coverage applied, different forms of unit testing, acceptance testing, system testing, you can automate this. Um, you can test your monitoring system, maybe not fully automated, but with some sort of fire drill kind of examples. You can do chaos engineering and practice. Um, and there can, there's a large number of tests that you can think about. Um, we had a small exercise kind of applying this uh, from the paper, right? Kind of thinking about what are all the different test strategies that might be useful if you're actually building a system. And then also talked about that their interactions, we have actually often multiple components that feed into each other. And you can test a model in isolation, but you really need to test them. Uh, they might interact. Im improving one model might actually decrease the quality of other models in the large scheme of things. So you actually need to do some end-to-end -end testing. And in practice, a lot of this will lead into DevOps, kind of heavy automation, um, what we talked about what is DevOps, there are tons of tools, and we kind of expanded, we talked a bit about Docker and some of those tools and Kubernetes. Um, my slides are not catching up. Um, and then we talked about ML ops as kind of the same for bridging kind of machine learning and operations, pushing models into production. A bunch of tools that you looked at in, in one of the homework assignment were actually in this field of how can we actually push models, test models. And there's again, a huge amount of tools, um, concepts fairly similar to, to DevOps. And this was a homework assignment here where each of you looked at a different tool. We talked about this, right? Um, at least I had fun reading all those blog posts. Um, maybe you also learned something out of this. Um, and then you also used a bunch of these things. I made you test your models. I made you test your infrastructure, right? Um, kind of think about quality, automate things and so on. So this was kind of the step in the lecture where we had most of the technical steps of kind of building and deploying the model out of the way, right? So we thought about architecture and requirements and building the system and testing the system. Um, whereas now we looked at different qualities in more detail. We started with fairness with an intro on ethics, where we talked about the difference between legal and ethical practices, right? And how we as software engineers and also data scientists with a few lines of code can actually have a very massive impact on a lot of people, um, which can lead to damage, right? Can lead to all kinds of problems that we may not have foreseen, um, things like addiction, this, this is the depressing lecture, right? Where we talked about all these different kinds of problems um, that we can enforce, right? Depression and so on, if we're not careful, unemployment, de-skilling, um, polarization, and so on and so on. Um, we talked specifically about discrimination, how this is a concept that's both has an ethical and a legal component, uh, that they're different notions. So it's actually quite important to distinguish equality and equity and justice, because depending on what your goal is, what you're kind of aiming for, you might uh, adopt different solutions. And we talked about different forms of discrimination. And we started with different forms of harms, harms of allocation, harms of representation, and then about different sources, like. Discrimination is a technical concept, and, but it's often 
um, kind of harmful. And where does it come from, right? It might come from um, just historical bias, uh, tainted examples that we're using to train things, skewed samples. And we talked about a bunch of these, right? Sample size disparity where you train on kind of bias data. Um, and that this can actually have quite massive potential for massive damage, um, right? Especially if, you, if you're if triggering feedback loops, you have bias training data, you're learning a model that encodes this bias, has biased outcomes, so you get bias telemetry, which feeds back into your model. So the example that we talked about most, I think, is predictive policing. If you have bias data to begin with, you send police into neighborhoods that are already disadvantaged, and it's kind of, um, picking up on minor crimes and reinforcing itself, unless you specifically design for this, right? So here we talked about how can we, what are the actual measures? What are the actual tools that we have available? Again, at the model level and at the system level, um, there are a bunch of different notions of fairness, fairness through blindness or anti-classification, um, which you can test for, or different forms of classification parity, especially independence uh, we talked about in separation. Um, which are different forms of checking that the acceptance rate or the error rates are similar across groups or that we're not using protected attributes in those groups. And we talked about how different uh, forms of these, um, these metrics are mutually exclusive and they correspond with different goals that we might have in the system. Right? So the challenge here is actually, from my perspective, a requirements engineering challenge, figuring out what do we want to achieve with the system? What are the risks? What are the potential uh, fairness problems? What do we care about? And what form of fairness um, should we use? And then in a more practical setting, we talked about what can we do? Well, at the model level, you can do some data augmentation, some pre-processing and some cleaning. Um, you typically reduce accuracy a little bit, but get fairer outcomes. Um, but really you need to consider fairness throughout the life cycle, at the, <clears throat> at the system level, throughout all stages. And we talked about kind of practitioner challenges from the paper and then a bunch of best practices that you can use kind of think about at every stage of the process. Um, what might be fairness issues in the data source, in the data collection, in the processing, in the feature engineering, in the training, um, in the user interface design and so on. Data sheets and model cards were two forms of documenting uh, more clearly what you're doing, which are things that are currently actually picking up some steam in the, in the community. People um, get more sensitive to this. The homework on this was looking at credit scoring and your recommendation system and kind of applying these different uh, techniques. Another lecture that kind of fits with this also um, and is very useful for debugging is thinking about inter interpretability and explainability, um, where actually explaining some of your predictions may give the user much more meaningful insights. So here we predicted anomalous uh, commits. And if we can say why something is anomalous, people might actually pay attention. Um, but it's also useful to understand the model to figure out inspect it, right? For example, is this fair? Is this the right model? Um, to have humans have trust in it, apply it, that it's not just black box, to debug a problem. Um, and there are certain systems, you may even have legal requirements, and there are certain systems that are inherently interpretable which is kind of hard to capture because interpretability doesn't really have a mathematical definition. It's how well humans can kind of explain a decision or ex predict the model's results, um, which is hard to measure. Um, but some of the models we can understand much better, right? Sparse linear models is something that we can understand. Decision trees is something that we can understand as long as they're not too big. Um, whereas there's a huge amount of research and in practice, we often don't use those models. We use um, deep neural networks. We use kind of random forests, things like this are much harder to understand or impossible essentially to, to understand. So we typically go for explanations, right? So there are lots of techniques. We looked at a bunch of them like global surrogates, um, local surrogates like Lyme, um, like partial dependence graphs and all kinds of forms and shapes, feature importance, anchors as kind of invariants that we're mining. Right? So a whole zoo of different techniques that are actually didn't 
unfortunately make you use. But I think they're interesting to think about uh, counterfactual explanations, which link to adversarial examples that we talked about later, right? Finding, finding the nearest example essentially um, that would have the opposite outcome. We talked a little bit about, isn't that dangerous providing explanations? Can't this lead to hacking the model? And that this may depend a lot on the use case, right? So face ID, telling somebody how to kind of get to a different result is maybe different than from loan applications. Um, and yeah, a bunch more techniques uh, that we can use that there's a component with user interface design, right? How do you present this? Um, transparency can actually be very powerful, right? So if you don't tell people that there's a model um, or explain how the model works, they may have misunderstandings. Um, there are lots of cases. And we talked about this argument of maybe we should have a policy, at least for high stakes decisions, right? Uh, kind of political decisions to always use interpretable models and how there's a whole push and discussion um, around regulation, like companies are presenting themselves as responsible, pushing kind of the idea of responsible AI, fair AI, uh, investing in research in this area, maybe partially to avoid regulation, but also regulation seems to pick up steam. There's uh, lots of interest in kind of figuring out what can we allow, um, what should we require, uh, how much, how far can we push black box models. Another part that had to do with debugging and kind of understanding solution for versioning provenance and reproducibility, where we talked about if you have one of these PR disasters, how can you figure out which model made the wrong prediction, um, which data was used to train that model, can we change it, can we test it? And especially often we have more complicated pipelines or models where multiple predictions flow into each other. And so we really talked a lot about versioning models, that there are a bunch of different approaches, different trade-offs, uh, versioning data, versioning models, versioning entire pipelines. We looked at a few tools like DVC, ModelDB, and MLflow um, that some of you presented. Um, looked a little bit about problems around uh, reproducibility and especially non-determinism. Um, and I made you do some of this as part of the last milestone, right? That you as, at least uh, track some provenance. And then nearing the end here, we talked about security and um, security, privacy, adversarial learning and safety. So in the se security lecture, again, model level and system level, we talked about security properties, um, understanding the attacker and different forms of attack, including poisoning attacks, a way to try to, to make the system essentially unusable by poisoning the training data, or we craft specific training data examples to make it mispredict certain examples that you want to get in. Um, defenses against this, but also evasion attacks where you specifically craft inputs that lead to a wrong prediction, right? Independent of the training data. Um, we explained a little bit where this is coming from, that the task decision boundary and the model decision boundary is not the same and that you're trying to find ways that kind of uh, lie in between the two. The way to generate adversarial examples, a bunch of machine learning techniques that you can use to specifically search for them. Right? So you can randomly search in the neighborhood, but often it's much more effective if you know something about the model, if you even have access to the model parameters that you can follow the gradient, things like this. Um, we talked about robustness as one of the measures here. Like, can we measure or guarantee that in the neighborhood around a specific prediction, we always have the same outcome. We talked that, about that there's always a decision boundary, but for many points, we could figure out that they're actually robust, right, around their neighborhoods. Um, there's a lot of research on this right now. Um, I just gave you a sense of where this is going, like formal verification and some sampling and probabilistic reasoning uh, techniques, uh, but robustness tools are out there and you can use some of them, but using them in practice is still hard. You can use them when you make a prediction, but you have a very high runtime cost typically, um, and current techniques don't scale particularly well, or you can use them doing testing and debugging on some of your training data. Um, 
So we talked a little bit about privacy issues um, and that privacy is also hard and you might extract things from the model um, and there are some defenses against this and uh, generative adversarial networks as kind of what's producing deep fakes and, and how they're working. Uh, but really, again, there are defenses for a lot of these things, but it's much, you get much more sanity and much more results out of this if you think about this at the system level, right? Not just the model robustness, really thinking about how to integrate this, how to integrate this with user interface design. For example, give some input data more trust by having a trust mechanism in your system, having a crowdsourced mechanisms of labels, uh, especially for malicious data, um, bunch of interface design techniques. And actually threat modeling, which you also covered in recitation is one common inspection technique that might be useful to just systematically inspect your architecture for potential security problems that you can then think about addressing. Um, and maybe some of the more traditional security design principles like least privilege or isolation might also help here. And finally, AI can be used for cybersecurity or for security in general as well, right? So you can use machine learning to detect attacks. And this is arms race, but this is a very common research technique like intrusion detection, anomaly detection, uh, things like this. For safety, uh, we talked again about all kinds of problems, but then also about different kinds of solutions. So it's hard because we have so many edge cases and unknown cases. Um, robustness can help again, but it really, you probably want to understand the risks. You want to understand this at the system level, not just make sure that the model is robust, but understand at a broader system and test, uh, test your way through this. Um, there are a bunch of problems and just kind of weird side effects, right? We talked about, it's really hard to specify um, goal functions properly. There's lots of examples of reward hacking. So you kind of have to be careful about the, these things again, but a bunch of kind of traditional safety engineering techniques might be also useful here, right? If you think of a machine learning component as an unreliable component, there's a bunch of things you can do. Um, we talked about self-driving cars where I was surprised that none of you was kind of nerding out on this um, about that we're getting better, but it still seems to be quite a far way off to, to fully have full automation. This is widely recognized. Um, and again, you should think about ethics and kind of more standard approaches and think about um, also non-traditional safety cases, not just the nuclear power plants and self-driving cars, but also all kinds of apps, whether they have some sort of safety implication. All right, almost done here. Um, Last lecture, uh, we talked about interdisciplinary teams, right? Different roles on a team. It's not just data scientists and software engineers, but more specific roles. People often talk about unicorns as a people who can do everything, but probably the more useful way to think about this is having interdisciplinary teams. And then you need to think about how do you scale teams, right? If you have um, big teams, you have kind of communication overhead, you kind of need to structure this. Um, you have conflicting goals, you kind of need to deal with that. Um, you might want to hire T-shaped people so that people have overlapping comp expertise, but different specialties, right? So that they can talk to each other, different forms of organizations, different forms of group thing, uh, social loafing. And that's today. So this is what we talked about, right? Kind of the larger perspective, kind of software engineering, data scientists, bringing them together. Um, and as I said, I have more parts to that. I want you to look back at the semester. I've talked a lot, so I want you to talk about uh, a little bit. So I wanna think a little bit about, what, see what you think, where this field is going, right? So I tried to pitch that we kind of need software engineers and data scientists to work together, to have awareness of each other. Um, with all of this, let me just ask a very open question. What do you think are the main challenges, maybe from a software engineering perspective, at least kind of in building actual systems, where are tooling gaps, research gaps? Um, where do we have maybe methods but need to adapt them? Um, any ideas what you think the main problems might be?
it seems like some of it relates to quality and how how difficult it is to measure quality and uh, the fact that it's domain specific it, it seems like there might be some way to make it easier to do that whether you kind of um, you know group some domains together and, and set up some tooling so it's easy if you're doing a recommendation engine where you want to maximize time on the site or something like that like some common stuff but I, I don't really know but it seems like that could be a p potential direction yeah there's there's quite a bit of interest in kind of testing of machine learning systems um, I haven't seen much that generalizes on domains but kind of coverage and test case generation of deep neural networks, um, often robustness, often fairness. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, simulation quite a bit. Anything else? Just going by the software engineering practices, I think a lot of work is needed or needs to be learned to identify from the beginning part, like the requirements itself, as we have gone through. People are uh, only a few people are worried about things like fairness, robustness, and things like that. As and when machine learning is progressing, now we are initially it started as like a fun game. Uh, oh yes, we are able to predict something. That's fun. But now we are making actual systems out of it. Re requirements, even like I feel management by itself as a software engineering practice needs to evolve a lot in terms of uh, handling these machine learning projects. Right now. And the things are just being about agile, but there is a lot more that may be hand, that needs to be handled only which is machine learning specific. Yeah, I have the impression in the requirements engineering field, we're leaving a lot of room kind of, there could be way more research and there's a lot of the data scientists, data, uh, data science or machine learning community kind of figures out and kind of starts doing requirements engineering. Um, the software engineering requirements engineering field and conferences don't seem to have a huge amount of discussion there. And I think there's, I don't know whether it's research or just practice, right? Kind of mm -hmm. hiring requirements engineers or training them on this. Um, but from my perspective, this is one of the things that I learned through this process, through reading this, that seems really important and kind of under, under discussed. Other things? I think we talked about, you know, so many important topics throughout the entire course, but it strikes me that um, explainability seems to have a part to play in so many of them, almost like it's a hub. Explainability will improve your fairness. Explainability can help your safety yeah. reviews. Explainability could make sure that your requirements are being met and your quality. So it, it seems like explainability is, is going to become even more important. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. also architecture, um, it, it just, it seems like there should be some patterns very specific to ML. And, and as far as at least we covered, it didn't seem like there were many. Uh, I know when we were talking about like the trade-off stuff, it seemed like there were a number of use cases where uh, we kind of wanted like edge computing, like machine learning on your phone, but the phone wasn't quite powerful enough to do what we wanted, but then we didn't want to store it on the cloud. So it, it seems like there's some sort of like in between pattern that might uh, come up or has already arisen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have the impression that a lot of these things are done in some projects, but it's, I don't think there's a lot of kind of codified knowledge. Mm -hmm. that I'm aware of, yeah. Yeah, so in a similar vein as well, I've noticed um, a gap, I guess, with communication between data scientists and software engineers, and specifically with architecture. Um, you know, architects don't really understand, you know, what is a model, uh, you know, from the data science point of view, mm -hmm. and the data scientists uh, usually don't understand, you know, the architectural uh, language, you know, what's a component, where does the model fit in. Yeah. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, that communication or language needs to improve. 
-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a, this is actually interesting. So I went into this mostly for teaching and I thought maybe I find tons of research problems. And I think there are a bunch of them, um, but I come back to the point that maybe a lot of this, we already have techniques. Maybe it's a, an education problem first to make people talk to each other and understand the existing techniques, maybe to adopt some of the requirements, engineering and safety techniques that we have for a long time, um, not reinvent everything. Um, there's certainly important questions and I think the community picks up on uh, testing quite a bit as a big problem, right? Um, the, the fairness work happens mostly outside of software engineering. This is something the and, and fairness and explainability is essentially all in, in the machine learning community and kind of a few other communities. Um, yeah. So there's this discussion I suspect a bunch of you have seen this notion of software 2.0. Um, I specifically left this out up to this point. Um, the guy here, Andre uh, Capati, is uh, the head of AI at Tesla. He wrote this blog post on software 2.0, which is really broadly cited, which essentially says there are lots of problems here where we can um, this is also widely discussed uh, in natural language translation, right? That originally you had thousands of lines of codes, of rules, and so on, and now we replace it with 20 lines of TensorFlow code, right, and data. Um, so what do you think? Are the software engineers disappearing? Are we replacing them by machine learning uh, and automatically written code? I really don't think so because software engineering is way more than software development. Like just being part of the program, I mean, uh, like there is a lot more like the thinking that we need to do essentially while building the software, all these trade-offs and things like that. That that I I don't think AI is there yet to make those trade-offs essentially. Maybe maybe there's a ma magic breakthrough at some point, right? But um, right now there's specific things um, of kind of making predictions for certain tasks that are where it's very suitable, right? And where it's really, really hard to write manual solutions. And there it's clearly superior, right? But in the end, you still have a model that you need to integrate into something else. So I think the rest of the system and the stuff for which we have good um, specifications or better ideas, I haven't seen much success in automating any of that. There's a lot of work on synthesis where you give a few examples and it comes up, this scales to a few dozen lines of code, um, right? So it's, we are far from here is the text code of the US and let's automatically write something like TurboTax, right? Uh, complete, including payment solution and everything. So um, I suspect that's quite far. Um, this is the other discussion. Have you seen AutoML? Um, so is a data scientist becoming obsolete? AutoML is a thing that essentially tries a bunch of deep neural network architectures and will automatically tune things and do some feature engineering for you. Um, so a lot of kind of traditional stuff on data cleaning and kind of thinking about the deep neural network architecture, like how many layers and so on might become less important over time. Do we still need data scientists? I think this might start pushing or bridging the gap between data scientists and software engineers because it eliminates some of the exploratory role of data scientists and then their focus starts shifting towards, okay, the, the search produced these sorts of models, are those actually appropriate for my context? What sort of mistakes are they making? Which seems to be a little more in the software engineering space. Mm -hmm. um, just to add on to that, 
um, I'm not sure like what all capabilities AutoML has, but I think uh, explainable, explainability <laughs> is one of the major factors in understanding why that output is coming, essentially. And uh, we have gone through the processes of correlation versus causation and things like that. I'm, I'm not really sure how much it handles those things. That's an interesting argument. This is essentially counter to kind of uh, Cynthia Rulin's argument about using interpretability everywhere, right? So um, this makes it even more black box. It's essentially have some data, produce a model, and don't yeah. even try to understand anything. Um, so I think I think in both fields um, there are certain tasks that become routine over time. Right, so hyperparameter optimization a few years ago, maybe you wrote some code, now you use a framework to do this automatically, right? Uh, some of the feature extraction code, maybe you, you needed a PhD earlier in kind of understanding statistics and distribution and really figuring out how to use it, this becomes easier. I think the same is true on the software engineering side, right? So we had this picture at some point in the technical debt paper about how there was a small box of 50 lines of machine learning code and all these big boxes of uh, lots of lines to deploy the model, to monitor the model, right? So it's also no longer the case that we're writing all of those systems from scratch, right? We're standardizing a lot of things. We have lots of frameworks that deploy things automatically, that monitor things automatically. So with fewer lines of code, we also become more powerful. And I think in both cases, the nice part is the more we automate, the more we can focus on the interesting parts, right? The parts that matter. We kind of get rid of the kind of the routine things. And that's, that has a super long history in computer science and software engineering. We always abstract, we always kind of try to automate, right? Um, think about writing stuff in, uh, in assembler code first and then higher level abstractions, right? So we're way more productive and then we're using frameworks and we're using libraries and we're way more abstractive. Um, these days you can write a web server in a few lines of Node.js code um, that would have taken weeks, like a few years ago, right? To write this kind of stuff and scale it and deploy it and uh, build a distributed system that actually works. So I think this is probably true also here that you won't get rid of data scientists, but you have data scientists doing more interesting stuff. Here's a nice quote um, around this, right? Auto ML does not spare the end of data scientists as it does not auto select the business problem. It doesn't auto select indicative data. It doesn't auto align stakeholders. It doesn't auto ethics. It doesn't auto integrate with the rest of your products, right? It doesn't do auto marketing after the fact. Um, you can argue that some of those are not specifically data science role, roles, right? So that maybe the thing that we, some of the activities that we think of data science now will probably shift. But I think that's also true for software engineering, right? Um, we're also spending less time writing web server code and more time maybe on business logic and can even abstract this or, um, I think there's an interesting question here. By, by making things easier, we empower people to do more things, right? So are we giving more software engineering power to data scientists? For example, a data scientist with kind of ML flow or kind of ML ops kind of techniques can deploy models directly into production, right? Um, or are we giving also more data science power to software engineers? So maybe before you really depended on a, soft, a data scientist to build the deep neural network. And now you can do a lot of these things and use AutoML or some techniques um, uh, to get faster. So this is a colleague of mine. We had a weird Twitter discussion at some point, um, which I usually avoid, but um, virtually everyone is or will soon be building machine learning applications. Only few can afford having a dedicated team of software engineers um, or a software engineering education for themselves. It would be more inclusive to build software engineering into the machine learning processes themselves more fundamentally so that everybody can build things better. What do you think about this? <laughs> 
I think it seems reasonable because I think currently software engineers are cheaper than uh, data scientists. So companies will follow the path of the least expense. And so they'll just start giving software engineers more ML responsibilities or process improvements and hire the cheaper labor. Okay. Yeah, this argument here was the other direction, right? So that people are trained on machine learning and they kind of can do the software engineering stuff be without being educated in software engineering. Mm. Um, that would be an argument for software engineers taking more of a data science role there. Yeah. Um, other thoughts or opinions? I would say that I agree with his original premise that um, everyone will be building ML applications because um, everyone is collecting data, no matter what their mission is, profit, nonprofit, everyone's collecting more data and they need to make better insights of it. Everyone wants to make data-driven decisions instead of kind of more arbitrary uh, qualitative decisions. So um, it is a challenge that organizations everywhere will have to reason about. Mm -hmm. So I like this empowerment story, right? So can we make it easier for some groups to do more software engineering or do more data science? Um, I'm not sure I agree with, well, this is maybe not so directly in here, but I think we still need software engineers on the team. We can't just fold this into um, into kind of data science responsibilities. Um, because that essentially means we're going all for unicorns again, right? We're going for people who can do everything and then have probably, you need some expertise to do this stuff. So ideally, yes, maybe it becomes so easy that everybody can do everything. Um, but I think there's some expertise and I have some analogy here that um, I just wanna test essentially on you. Um, so I've been watching weirdly a bunch of these home renovation shows, um, don't judge me, um, right, where they essentially always take down the walls to the studs and then rebuild everything and kind of coming from Germany where we're used to stone houses, this seems all like easily mendable, right, so and often these are not professional, so they kind of do a bunch of these things by themselves. And it feels to me that some of this discussion is like, we're inventing better tools, right? So doing, you may have done this with a hammer before, now you have a nail gun and it certainly does it better. And you can do a lot more construction, right? Even without a lot of training in construction, but I would still feel uncomfortable just letting people build whatever without a structural engineer, right? So at some point you probably want some expert who knows what they're doing, at least to help them. And so in my view, yes, we want to make things easier, but up to a degree. I don't think we want to, there is some special knowledge here. There's some special expertise. And I don't think that we should require from everybody who renovates their house to become an expert in uh, structural engineering. And I don't think we get far away that structural engineering knowledge is no longer needed because the nail gun figures out what the weight of the house is or what will collapse. Right, so this is again, I may be overstating this, but I think of this as an education problem. We want interdisciplinary teams. We want people who can talk to each other. Um, maybe you only need a software engineer as a consultant once in a while, um, like a structural engineer in a house. Right? Maybe you don't need them on your team permanently, but you need at least to understand their concerns, understand their language, understand when to ask them. And I think the way forward is software engineering still, I think, has a big role here as data science, right? So, um, and I think we shouldn't give away all the requirements engineering and hope that this will automatically right? Um, thinking about building a larger system, everything around the machine learning component, right? Software architecture, deployment, um, automation, uh, quality assurance, and so on. So I think we have a lot of expertise, a lot of things to contribute to. We want to make it easier for others, but I think we want to, maybe I'm biased here, but I think we want to continue playing a role. And 
I mentioned this before, I think DevOps is a nice role model here, kind of thinking about joint responsibility, joint processes, joint tools. We haven't made the operator's role or the developer's role unnecessary, right? We empowered both sides a bit, but up to the point, we still want the experts in the room. So that's all I have. Um, oh, may, maybe some feedback on this, or does it resonate? I mean, you have certainly reduced the number of ops people required, really, since you have given more, since you have given more responsibility to developers in that sense. Right, but I think we still need the expertise, right? Not every developer is a unicorn who knows everything about operations and there's, and most developers, even though they know Docker containers, don't know how to scale this in a data center. I have just like another thought over here. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's going to spawn a new set of uh, development activities that will come in future. Just going back and thinking about like, I believe a few years back in um, like around 20, 30 years back, I think systems was one of the biggest thing that everyone should know at that point of time. And uh, once we have standardized it and we have built things on top of it, it's not like system engineers have died. It's just like a new roles have come up like application engineers and we are having more and more application engineers in place. Mm -hmm. So I believe like having this amalgamation in place, we will have new set of era that will come like new set of applications that will spawn a new mm -hmm. type of engineers as well. Yeah, I also think that as long as humans are bad at defining goals, they'll never be out of the loop because how is a machine supposed to interpret what our goal is when we can't even tell it what we want, which is why you can like, you can automate the creation of a static website because my goal is to surface some information, the machine gets that, but for more complicated things, it, you know, I, you, Netflix probably can't even fully explain what their goals are. There's like making money, but making money in a movie contact, you know, mm -hmm. it, it gets really complicated. And uh, as long as we can't communicate well, uh, we'll still have jobs, which is nice. <laughs>